My neighbor is one of those annoying wannabe YouTube personalities. Over the years, I've seen him cough out cinnamon, lay flat on the hood of his car as it slowly creeps down the driveway, and douse himself in lukewarm water, all the while screaming epic win, epic fail, or epic maintenance of the status quo, for all I know. It can get tiring to watch him go about his shenanigans in the pursuit of viral fame. So when he knocked on my door the other day, told me he was going away for a few weeks, and asked if I would get his mail, honestly, it was a relief. I can't explain the peace of mind I had knowing I didn't have to brace myself for any of his stupidity for a while. I was always afraid his stunts would wind up bleeding over into my life. Things were pretty normal for the first couple of days. He received a few bills, a bit of spam, and what I could only assume was a birthday card. Then one evening, I got home to find a cardboard box waiting on his front porch in big red letters was written, return to sender. I'm no small fry, but I admit I had trouble lifting the box on my own. It was really freaking heavy. Lugging it across the road to my house was even harder, and I quickly realized there was no way I was going to drag it up the stairs and through my front door. I decided I'd leave his package in my garage. It wasn't like I kept my car in there. The garage door was a piece of crap that refused to open without a good thug and a whack. It was less trouble just leaving the car in the driveway than it was to fight with the garage door every morning and night. In hindsight, I should have set the package down while I struggled to open the tricky door, but you know how it is when you've got a good grip on something. No point in setting it down if you don't have to. It was as I kicked the door for a third time that I lost my grip on the package and it fell to the ground. I heard a light crack inside. I hoped I hadn't broken anything important, but I figured I just wouldn't tell my neighbor about it and let him assume the break happened en route. Hands free, I finally managed to get the garage door unstuck and boy did it screech in protest as I rolled it up over me. I dragged the box the rest of the way, setting it in the corner for whenever my neighbor would come back to claim it. And then I forgot all about it until a few days passed. I'm not sure exactly how long it took for the smell to waft in from the crack under the garage to house door, but it came in slow progression. It was a sickly sweet odor similar to a skunk, and for the first few days after I smelled it, I genuinely assumed that's exactly what it was. Roadkill that had left its mark on my house. It was only when I realized the scent was growing more intense instead of fading that I went looking for the source. That's when I opened my garage door, and that's when the odor knocked me back holding my nose. The culprit wasn't hard to identify. The only change in my garage was the box in the corner. I remember thinking it must have been one of those meat of the month subscription boxes. The meat must have gone rancid from being left out of the fridge for so long. How much meat could have been in there for a box to have been so large and heavy? An entire freaking cow? I covered my nose as I approached the box, a pair of scissors in my hands. I probably wouldn't have needed them to open it as it became soggy enough at the bottom to poke through with a finger, but I wasn't about to poke my finger into spoiled meat juices. That soggy bottom was the reason I had to open the box in the first place. If I tried to drag it out whole, everything would spill onto the floor. I was going to have to dump the pieces of meat, one garbage bag at a time, and take them down to the dumpster, a process I was not looking forward to. My scissors tore through the tape along the top of the cardboard box. I thought the smell couldn't get any worse, but as I flipped the flaps open, I discovered a whole new gamut of stink. It was like opening a burning oven, but instead of a heat wave, I was met with waves of piss, sweat, crap, and putrefaction. It was so bad that I staggered back and had to force down the puke, begging to guzzle out of me. I don't think I could have handled that scent mingling with the horrors coming out of the box. I'm not ashamed to admit that I ran out the door for a breath of fresh air, but in the short time I'd spent in the garage, the smell had become so ingrained in the fabrics of my clothes that it clung to me like a shadow. Nothing I tried could keep the smell out of my nostrils. Not air fresheners, not a face mask, not three showers and a change of clothes. Every second that box lay open in my garage was another second the smell was allowed a foothold into my home. I had to bite the bullet. I returned to the garage, the flaps of the box still open as though inviting me to look. I was prepared, a clothespin pinning my nostril shut, a garbage bag in one hand, the strongest cleaner I could find in the other, and long rubber gloves to keep my skid from having to touch what was inside. But as it turns out, I needed none of those things. I wouldn't have to touch or clean the contents of that box. I would only have to suffer the nightmares every night. You see, there was meat in that box, but it didn't come from a cow or a pig. No, it was worse than that. It was my neighbor, dead, still in one piece, 
but dead. I called the cops and naturally they took me in for interrogation. It's kind of hard not to suspect the man with the corpse in his garage after all. Thankfully, they soon realized I wasn't involved. My DNA might have been all over that box, the smell might have left a mark throughout my house, but there was one piece of irrefutable evidence in my neighbor's own hands that proved my innocence, a vlogging camera. They showed me the footage only once. I'm not sure if they were allowed to or if they felt so bad for me they figured it couldn't hurt. Either way, I saw it. My neighbor was sitting in the box outside of a shipping facility, laughing as he told the world how he was going to mail himself across state lines. He'd brought pee bottles, food, a pillow, and a few flashlights. His friend, a guy I'd seen a displaced several times to help with his stunts, closed the lid and presumably dropped him off for shipment. Throughout the next couple of hours or days, I'm honestly not sure, my neighbor recorded a few short clips about his progress. I think I'm in the truck now. I can feel it moving. Must be in the warehouse, pretty warm here, still got plenty of food, that kind of stuff. And then, on the last entry, the box toppled over. He broke his neck, and that was it. The camera recorded until either the memory card got too full or the battery died. There's one thing I didn't tell the police after they showed me the video. One thing I heard in the footage that will haunt me till the day I die. Just after the tumble that broke his neck, I heard the familiar screeching sound of my garage door. On a joyous, warm summer night, a bride and a groom marry in the backyard of the bride's large family farmhouse that she grew up in. Everyone was drinking quite a bit, and they all made the tipsy decision to play hide-and-seek during the reception in hopes that they could have a fun game for the children at the wedding to play with them. The groom was it, and after counting, he started searching and finding his guests. The bride snuck into the farmhouse as she knew how to win the game and had the best idea for a hiding place. She hid so well, no one was able to find her for the rest of the party. The groom was not worried. He figured she had just gone inside to rest, so eventually the party ended and everyone went home. When the groom went inside, he realized he still couldn't find the bride, and that's when they started to worry. They filed a report with the police, but the bride was never found. The groom was heartbroken, assuming the bride had changed her mind about the wedding and used the game as an easy way to run away without confronting him. Years passed, and the bride's mother dies, and so the bride's father decides to go through the farmhouse to get all their stuff in order. When he gets to the attic, he finds an old, large trunk they long forgot about. He struggles to open the lid as the lock is rusty. As it finally gives, he screams in horror as he finds his daughter's decayed body in the trunk. Her jaw is still open as if she was screaming when she died and there were scratch marks all over the inside of the chest lid. It said she suffocated in the trunk after a day or two of no one finding her. To Brie Ice Q. Subject, Brie, please read this. Brie, don't delete this. I know you hate me, but we were best friends once and I need you to read this. I think I'm in serious trouble and there's nothing you can do, but I need you to read this so you can understand. I know we haven't talked since sectionals. It's been forever, but what happened to you wasn't my fault. At least it wasn't entirely my fault. I know everyone thinks it was, but I would never do anything to hurt you. This is going to sound crazy, but I need to tell you this so that someone knows. It started when we were in the eighth grade. It was the night before the Crystal Classic competition. I was at home and I couldn't sleep because I was so nervous about competing. Well, I got on the computer, just sort of surfing the web and stuff, but I couldn't concentrate on anything. I was just sitting there, so I googled myself. I never should have done that, Brie. At first, it was all the usual stuff you find when you google yourself, but then I found a link to a Wikipedia page about me. I thought our club or my dad made it or something. There wasn't much there, just some basic facts about skating, what city I lived in, but the thing that got me was that it said I won that year's Crystal Classic. I laughed. I thought for sure someone did it just to encourage me. I confronted my dad about it, but he denied it. When I won the competition the next day, I was so happy. That was the first competition I had ever won and it felt so good. Remember how hard I worked after that? That's when my parents hired Sergey to coach me. You know how much that must have cost. After that, I would check my page before every competition and it would always tell the result of how I placed. 
It said I would win the regionals at 15 and it all came true. After that, Sergey convinced my mom and dad that I had a real shot at the Olympics. That's when they pulled me from school. I skated every day, but I just wasn't progressing the way Sergey said I needed to if I wanted a shot at the championship. I was working so hard and I was skating well, but still Sergey said it wasn't good enough. When the sectionals came, all I could think about was winning. So I did something I shouldn't have. Everyone was saying that you were the favorite and I felt like I had already lost the competition so I made a Wikipedia account and tried to update my page to say that I was the winner. The thing is that after I tried to update the page, I checked it and all it said was, Anora Petrova is a selfish little bitch who is going to get what she deserves. I broke down. That's why I looked so awful the next day. I was in a daze. I remember watching your routine and seeing your blade snap and the next thing I know, I was on the ground and my face was covered in blood from where the tip flew off and sliced my forehead. Then they told me it was my fault because I had your skates in my possession earlier. Bree, I honestly didn't do anything to your skates. I wanted to win, but I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. When they told me I was banned from any further competitions, everyone said that I got what I deserved. Nobody even asked for my side of the story. I guess you heard that Sergey dropped me after that. He said I ruined him. No one would talk to me. Do you know what it's like to be ostracized by everyone? I couldn't even get ice time. And then the page got worse. Anytime I'd check it, it would say all these horrible things about me. I can't even tell you half of them. The language was so vile. I'd cry every time I read it, but I couldn't stop checking it. I knew I had to do something, so I made a complaint to Wikipedia. I even tried calling them, but no one there claimed to know anything about the page. I was home alone that Friday night, and I decided to check it to see if it had been taken down. The page was still there, only this time it said, Anora Petrova is a pathetic little orphan. I freaked. I kept calling my parents to warn them, but every time I'd call, all I would hear was this horrible laughter on the other end. I must have called them a hundred times until I couldn't take the sound of the laughing anymore. After the accident, the police gave me their phones and there wasn't any record of my calls that night. I was so devastated. Before that, I was so busy training all day and doing homeschool, I never realized just how alone I had been the whole time. I know you tried to reach out, but I was so depressed and angry, I just shut everything out. Once I turned 18 and got the settlement money from the court, I came to Switzerland. I got to reinvent myself. My skating really took off. It hasn't been a year, and I feel like everything that happened was so long ago. That's why I shouldn't have done it, Brie. I'm writing you now from an old hotel outside of Prague. I'm auditioning for the ice circus tomorrow. I know it's the kind of thing we used to make fun of, but I really want this. It's so hard to say this, but when I checked the page to see if I'd get the job tomorrow, all it said was Anora Petrova died friendless and alone. And it has today's date listed as the date of my death. I'm sobbing so hard, I can barely type this, but I wanted you to know the truth. Please believe me, Brie. I attached a screenshot of the page so you'll believe me. It's all there, just as I told you. I don't know what to do. I don't know anyone here and nobody speaks English. I keep refreshing the page. God, it's been forever. I keep refreshing, but it still hasn't changed. I'm waiting for midnight. I don't know what to do, so I locked myself in my room. There's only a few minutes to midnight now. All I can do is refresh the page. I'm exhausted, but I can't stop. I'm afraid to leave the computer until I know what happens next.